record. All right, welcome back here for week number two. I want to start uh, this week showing you guys a video that the National Science Foundation prepared for an introduction to civil engineering. And I really liked it. It, it focuses a lot on um, structural engineering, but um, it does give some mention to the other branches of civil engineering. So uh, it, it's really good. I'm going to show it. It's about a seven little, seven minute little video clip. Uh, before I do that, though, I also want everyone to just remember and be aware that that you're on the clock for project number one. Project number one is due next week, one week from now. So if you have no clue what I'm talking about, make sure you get on Learning Suite after class and, and go to Assignments, go to Project Number One, and you'll find the description for that. You can do that as a team with other classmates, or you can do that by yourself, however you'd like. Okay, so um, I'm going to share this video with you. If uh, you guys are having problems with it, just uh, comment in the chat, okay? Engineer Ken Moschke loves living and working in the city of Chicago. And from Ken's viewpoint, it's the structures that help bring the city to life. Every day, he gets to move to the pulse of a city filled with vitality, or ride, or climb, even skate. Just in time. Ken is a licensed civil engineer at Thornton Tomasetti, a world-renowned engineering firm. Civil engineering is really the jack of all trades of the engineering profession. It includes transportation, structures, what I do. There's geotechnical, construction, water resources. Together, it's mostly about the infrastructure that we all use and we live in. Civil engineering goes back to the earliest days of civilization. If anyone's responsible for building this country, it's civil engineers. Civil engineering is really a people-serving profession, especially when nature throws us a curveball. When it comes to hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, civil engineers are there to make sure that the buildings, the bridges, and the infrastructure stays operating and stays safe for people. Ken and his team specialize in structural engineering. Very simply put, structural engineering is making things stand up. Already in my career, I've worked on a huge variety of projects. I've worked on baseball stadiums, football stadiums, practice fields. I've worked on high rises here in Chicago and even internationally in Denmark and in the UAE, in Dubai. The architect usually gives us a pretty picture of the skin of the building. A structural engineer really looks beyond that into the guts and the bones that hold up that skin. The team is on their way to one of Chicago's most beloved icons. Rising from the ashes 17 years after the Great Chicago Fire, the Rookery Building was completed in 1888. Many times we get involved with historic construction and trying to preserve it at the Rookery Building we're going in, evaluating the existing structure, and trying to come up with new ways so that crews can keep it in top shape. Uh, the walls are all masonry bearing walls, and the interior is all steel frame construction. In the drawings, the civil engineers see a story of imagination and innovation. Pretty cool. Elevators, electric lighting, plate glass windows, fireproofing, features that define the modern skyscraper. Ken has a desk, but you'll rarely find him there. Let's open up the drawings and see if we can find out what's going on. Looks like there's a step here, so I'm betting you see how they have the two beams adjacent yeah. to each other, that one of these is going to be high for this part. This bay could have a little more snow load on it. Then it's off to a presentation. Remarkably, Ken's day has just begun. Ken grew up on a farm, so you'd think the big city would mean a big adjustment. But in just a few short years, he's developed a special connection to the city. 
One of the reasons I went into structural engineering was because I wanted to be able to show people what I worked on. I've worked on that building over there. Here's another building I've worked on. Another one on this side of the river. We worked on the Chicago Board of Trade building too. When I was in high school, I didn't know necessarily that I wanted to be a civil engineer. I was good in math and science, but I think the best engineers are those that are very well-rounded and bring together a lot of different ideas. Some of Ken's projects involve routine structural maintenance. Others push structural design to the limits. Imagine putting a 50-story building on top of Union Station. That's what structural engineers do. This meant that we need to look at all the existing foundations and the columns and imagine a way to support the weight of a new structure on top of what was already there. What most folks don't see are the design challenges that Ken has to face. If a wind gust were to go and hit the building, this is the behavior that it would most likely start to move at. If it moves too quickly or too much, people might get sick, and then there's no way you could sell space on the top floor. A city would not be a city without buildings like these, or without rail lines, bridges and roads, water and sewage systems, things people count on to keep their city working. There's a lot of work that's involved with maintaining all of these parts of the infrastructure, and I guess engineers need to be a little more Clark Kent than Superman. That's why civil engineers don't just work with companies like Kent's. You'll also find them in municipal, state, and federal government settings, research facilities, and universities. Ken holds a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in civil engineering. Very rarely do I work on anything by myself, but together that helps us to come up with the best solution to the problems. In a sense, their job is to pave the way for the future by incorporating new materials, building techniques, and new ways to save energy. This is a project that I worked on with some architects trying to envision a way to use a currently undeveloped site in Chicago. We think the idea that we're presenting with green technology offers a way of the future, how buildings in the future will need to be planned and designed in order to be more sustainable in our infrastructure and in our cities. Green ideas like these are changing the way buildings are being built and renovated all over the world. I think there are so many other difficult questions in today's day and age dealing with the environmental impact of the building, how to deal with the building's energy needs. Engineers can be more involved with all aspects of that. Instead of just taking the skin that they give us for granted, let's go back and try and engineer a better way. Ken sees Chicago as a living city, ever evolving and ever in need of improvements. There's always something new to work on. It's wonderful having that feeling that all your hard work is paid off into something tangible. As he looks out into the future, Ken can see there's no end to what he can learn and what he can do to help cities like Chicago thrive. Awesome. So I am curious um, if any of you have any questions about that video. If you do, just raise your hand. Okay. No questions. Um, one of the things that I, I really liked that he said in there was every day, every day was a different day. And um, I found that to be true when I was a civil engineer. Um, I, I loved the variety. I loved being able to go into work and being able to work on a project for like a month or two months to the point where I get tired of it. And then I could just put it away. And we wrapped it up and move on and do some totally different project. Um, I really, really like that variety. And I loved, I loved the opportunity to travel, to get, to get outside, to meet new people, to see new places. 
um, I really enjoyed my career as a, as a consulting engineer there. So, okay, what I want to do is we are going to jump back in and um, we're going to jump right back in and finish the presentation we started last week. So uh, just bear with me one second while I get all of my controls up here. Perfect. All right, give me a, everyone give me a thumbs up or a yes if you can see the presentation right now. Yes. Awesome. Okay, thank you everybody. So last week I introduced one definition of what a civil and environmental engineer is supposed to do. And this week I'm going to introduce two more definitions. So uh, definition number two is that civil and environmental engineers protect people and they protect our planet. So what do I mean by that? Well, so I'm an earthquake engineer. Um, I specialize in dealing with earthquakes and particularly the response of the soil and foundation response and ground deformations and soil liquefaction. So I'm really fascinated by earthquakes. And statistics like this really interest me. Not because I'm a morbid guy, but because they demonstrate just how civil engineers are affecting people's lives. So there, here are the statistics from two earthquakes. The earthquake in 2010 that occurred in Haiti and near Port-au-Prince, Port and then the earthquake that occurred near Los Angeles, the Northridge earthquake in 1994. Both were similar magnitudes. The Haiti earthquake was just a little bit larger, magnitude 7, as the Northridge event was uh, magnitude 6.7. But the that Los Angeles area had about three times the population as Port-au-Prince Haiti did during its earthquake. But here's the big story. Look at the difference between fatalities. In 1994, from that big earthquake in that highly populated city, there were only 57 fatalities. In Haiti, there were 220,000 fatalities. Now, there's obviously a difference in terms of the resources, in terms of the economics between these two places. But perhaps the greatest difference is the standard of engineering. In California, there's very heavily regulated building codes that are there to protect people from things like earthquakes. In Haiti, they do have building code, but it's not very well regulated or enforced. And what they found and observed was that most of the damage and most of the fatalities occurred in structures that didn't follow the building code. And so we see how civil engineers are helping keep people safe. Here's another thing, um, and, and this might surprise a lot of people because um, and, and I've asked young students this question in the past. I've, I've asked and I've said, okay, which profession do you think has saved more lives in the last uh, 150 years? And almost everybody says the medical profession, the medical profession. And, and surely the medical profession has saved millions of lives. There's no doubt about that. Okay. But civil engineering ranks right up there. Now let's look at just one, one disease that used to ravage the world. Uh, cholera. I don't know how many of you guys have ever heard of cholera, but it, it was a terrifying disease. It, um, it's very similar to dysentery. You would uh, basically become very, very dehydrated and it could kill you in a matter of a very short period of time. So check out these statistics. Between between 1816 and 1826, oh, that's not going to work. Between 1816 and 1826, there were 
38 million people killed worldwide just from cholera. In the United States alone, between 1829 and 1851, there were 150,000 killed. But then civil engineers introduced clean water systems into infrastructure. And look what started happening. 1852, 60 that year. 1863, 75. 1881, that was a bad year. 96 people died from cholera. 1923. I'm not sure what happened in uh, 1962. Um, maybe, I don't know, that was uh, the baby boomer generation and uh, Woodstock era and stuff. So I don't know, maybe they stopped uh, having good personal hygiene or something. But anyway, you see the story, right? Now, even today, as of uh, 10 years ago, 2010, Cholera still kills between 100 to 130,000 people each year worldwide. But almost all of those fatalities are occurring in places in the world that don't have modern infrastructure, that don't have clean water. So civil engineers, because of the clean water systems that we have, have almost eradicated many diseases like cholera, like dysentery, completely from the United States. Another way civil engineers are interested in protecting people is in transportation. I got these statistics from my friends over here in the transportation area. Now check this out. These are, these are pretty recent statistics within the last five years. The number of automobile fatalities per million vehicles on the road. Germany is doing pretty good. And they're at 84 fatalities per million vehicles on the road. And that's even with the German Autobahn. I don't know how many of you guys have ever been to Germany or been on the Autobahn. And a lot of people are terrified of it because it's a giant freeway that has no speed limit. You can just drive as fast as you want to. But what makes the difference is they have beautiful geometric design with their freeways, with safe turning radii and safe um, materials for their for their base and safe pavement and so even though people are driving crazy fast on it there's very few fatalities the US checks in at 150 fatalities per million vehicles now just to show some comparisons look at Brazil Mexico uh, they're in the 700s now, um, I've been down in the last three years to Mexico City for some post-earthquake reconnaissance, and I thought I was going to die. I got into a Mexican taxi cab, and um, man, that's better than any uh, roller coaster ride you could do at a, at a theme park. It was insane. Um, and I served my mission in Brazil, so I can speak to the roads there. You're crazy if you get on the road in Brazil. China, 4,559. Angola, 9,425. Now, India, I've never been to India. I've had some colleagues who've been there, and they tell me that it is nutso. It is crazy because they don't have the traffic systems in place that they do in a lot of the, the western part of the world. So check this out, 11,000 fatalities per million vehicles. Afghanistan. 14,000 fatalities per million vehicles. Now, I mean, in Afghanistan, you got some other things going on like IEDs and stuff like that, but you get the point. The point is the civil engineers implementing traffic safety and traffic control systems can make a huge difference in the safety of uh, people. So let me pause there for a minute and ask that are there any questions so far about anything I talked about? If there are, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, Caitlin, Caitlin, you have a um, question. You can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Um, so you're talking about the, sorry, the like 
transportation system in Germany and how it's super crazy and they can go super, super fast, but there's like not as many fatalities as mm-hmm. say Afghanistan, Afghanistan. Um, yeah. I just think that's really interesting because like the transportation system can be so complex and like almost scary to drive on. But in Afghanistan, like if it's not as complex, it's, it's interesting that it's not as safe. Isn't that, yeah, that's a really good comment. Thanks for sharing that. And you're absolutely right. There's not nearly as many um, like ramps and turnoffs and things like that as there are in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, you just kind of look where you want to go and you drive there, um, hoping that you don't run into anybody. Uh, But that shows that those turnoffs, those ramps, all those things are really there to protect you. And they, they are really effective in doing that. Um, let's see, Philip. You had a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. So, because I I also went to Brazil, and how difficult would it be that even if they had certain codes for these civil engineers to build the roads, that because they, the people just don't care. Like in Brazil, like they've got traffic lines, they have lights. Sure, the roads they aren't as good as ours, but like, the people just don't care. So how often do civil engineers have to deal with just dumb people not doing what their roads and stuff are supposed to have them do? <laughs> yeah. You, <laughs> I'm sorry, your comment's making me laugh out loud. Not because it's bad, but it's true. And and we we do get frustrated at times. We do get frustrated with people who don't go along with the plan. Um, and that's one of the reasons, for instance, um, maybe you guys have, have – gone on some of these interchanges along I-15 in Utah County, um, like 500 East and American Fork, uh, Pioneer Crossing, um, let's see, the one in Lehigh, uh, exit 284 used to be one of these. It's called a diverging diamond. Have you ever noticed when you get off on those, you're suddenly on the left side of the road, not on the right? And have you ever wondered, like, what the heck, what's going on? Why am I on the left side of the road? And you kind of freak out and panic, but it's okay because you've got these giant concrete barriers that are steering you and there's really nowhere else you can go. So you just kind of go with traffic and you do what you do. Um, We've learned to do systems like that. Giant concrete barriers are really effective at steering traffic and telling it where to go. Little orange barrels, not so much. Okay, we'll take one more question, Logan. Yeah, I don't want to make this a mission reunion, Brother Frank, but I also went to Brazil. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. So uh, while I was there, I didn't actually see that many crashes, and they just had an amazing spatial awareness. Like, they could they could get two buses through on a one-lane street, and I'm just like, what the heck? But, like, seeing these statistics, I'm starting to realize – yeah, it d- it does have consequences. Maybe they're not as safe as they think they are, and I'm I'm kind of glad for our uh, U.S. regulations sometimes. Oh, me too. It, it, yeah, yeah, I know because when I was there in Brazil, all my Brazilian buddies would always make it a point to brag how there's fewer accidents in Brazil than there were in the U.S. and and they would always say things like, have you ever seen an accident here? And I'd say, no. And they'd say, see, yeah, whatever. The, you know, the, the truth is because I wasn't ever on the roads. I was always walking around on the sidewalk. Uh, That's why I didn't see them. The truth is there's lots of accidents in countries like Brazil. And so um, we have a, a really safe, relatively safe driving system here in the U S but that's why here in the U S and particularly in states like Utah, we have these models, and maybe you've seen them um, on commercials and, and on signs around the road that say zero fatalities, right? Our goal here in the U.S. is to get that number to zero. And so we have civil engineers working really hard to try to make that happen. They've got to overcome some things that we talked about, like the general um, ignorance and, and unwillingness of the population sometimes, but, but we're doing the best we can. Okay, what about protecting our planet? So in protecting our planet, really what I'm talking about is the environment and energy. 
and trying to be sustainable so that we can continue our way of life and our standard of living for a long time and not burn out all of our resources. So this is a pie chart from the last five years that shows current U.S. energy consumption. And it, this may not be a surprise to most of you, um, but almost 50% of our energy consumption in the U.S. goes into the buildings in which we live to, to support our standard of living and the things that we're doing in life. And so as civil engineers, we're very interested in finding ways to have more energy efficient buildings. And You'll see transportation takes about another quarter and industry takes another quarter. So there's engineering going on in those areas as well. But if you look at this, really about 75% of energy consumption here in the U.S. is tied to civil engineering. The other 25% comes from all of the other engineering disciplines. And uh, that's because civil engineering deals with the way people live their lives. And, and civil engineers, they concern themselves with everyday people. That's our client. That's who we serve. And so uh, it, it would make sense then that, that our discipline uses the most amount of, of energy. One of the uh, things that we have to worry about the most when it comes to protecting our planet is our limited resources. And, and one of the um, most valuable and precious limited resources is fresh water. So here's a case history for you to consider. There is an, uh, and this was given to me by Dr. Jones, our department chair. He's, he's one of the um, country's leading groundwater specialists. And uh, he was telling me about an aquifer in the middle of our country, and, and I, I hope I don't slaughter the name here. Uh, I'm going to give it my best. The Ogallala Aquifer. That's kind of fun to say. Ogallala. The Ogallala Aquifer. It's one of the largest aquifers in the world. And look where it's placed on this map. It's right in eastern Colorado, western Kansas, all beneath the, the almost the entire state of Nebraska, portions of Oklahoma and Northern and um, Western Texas. These areas are some of the most prime farmland in the country. And the, the farms in these states, in these areas here, uh, provide significant, significant food for not just our country, but for the entire world. This aquifer right here is provides 30% of all groundwater used for irrigation in the, entire, in the entire United States, 30%. And some groundwater modeling experts are saying at the current rate of depletion, that that aquifer could dry up in as little as 25 years. So think about what would happen if we took away 30% of our country's current irrigation for uh, its crops and its agriculture. The results would be devastating, not just for our country, but for the entire world. So as civil engineers, we want to find ways to reduce water consumption. So we'll work closely with agricultural specialists to find ways to be more efficient in our water usage. Okay. Let's move on to definition number three. Civil engineers design public infrastructure which increases prosperity. So um, in the comments, I want everybody to um, write their answer to this question. This sounds kind of like Jeopardy, right? Okay. Here's the deal. What do you think is the single greatest contributor to the United States economic success over the last uh, almost 100 years? Type in your answer. Wow, good job. Uh, I am seeing overwhelmingly that 
people are typing roads, freeways, roads, freeways, transportation. World War I, World War II, I'm seeing a few of good guests. Uh, and, and those did kick off a lot. Um, and those led to what I'm going to talk about. But good job, everybody. Those of you who said the highway system, transportation, you are correct. The highway transportation system was a massive project that was undertaken following, I, I'm sorry, I just saw a comment, hummus. <laughs> okay, I just had a laugh at that. That was funny, Aaron. Okay, back to what I was saying. The, the highway system, the highway interstate system was a project that was undertaken following World War II to connect all of the states of the United States and to allow easy access and transportation all across the nation. And it, it allowed the free exchange and shipment of goods from one state to another. And uh, it was completed in 1956. And it, this highway system remained the largest for 54 years, the largest in the world. Now, um, I see a, a question, it's a legitimate question from Stephen Wright about what about Alaska and Hawaii? And that's a really good question. There were highway systems that extended up to Alaska, but the majority of their goods were shipped in. And so ports became a huge staple for Hawaii and, or for Alaska. And the same is true for Hawaii, obviously. You can't build a, a massive bridge out there, though that would be awesome. But Hawaii does have its own interstate on uh, each of the islands. So um, I'm going to just read this verbatim, and you're free to uh, read along. It's not an exaggeration, but a simple statement of fact that the interstate highway system is an engine that has driven 40 years of unprecedented prosperity and positioned the United States to remain the world's preeminent power into the 21st century. It has returned more than $6 in economic productivity for each $1 it costs. And so when you consider that, it was an incredible investment and it really became very, very quickly the pride of the world and other nations followed suit. And everybody wanted to have a highway system that was um, similar to that in the US. And so you see a lot of countries today with um, similar highway systems. Moving on, um, energy and water. So in 1942, the Grand Coulee Dam was completed and it was the largest dam in the world for 42 years until uh, the Three Gorges Dam was completed in China. And the Grand Coulee Dam provides a tremendous amount of energy for surrounding communities and provides uh, fresh drinking water and recreation as well. And so it's, it hasn't come without its, its challenges, that's for sure, but we've become very proficient and, and skilled at building dams and managing the environmental consequences um, here in the United States. Now we're not perfect, Don't please don't interpret uh, what I said there to mean that we've got all the problems figured out, but we've learned a lot and there's a lot more to learn. Let's uh, go over to the West Coast. California, the, the state of California, is, has been the number one food and agricultural producer in the United States for more than 50 years. It's, it's currently estimated to produce about 50% or one half of all of the fruits and vegetables produced here in the United States. And that's because of its warm climate, its temperate climate, and the, the very fertile and great soils that it has over there. The problem is that it's a very arid state. And so uh, engineers have had to find ways to get very creative with the irrigation. And it's become even more challenging in recent years with the droughts that have plagued California. But even still with the droughts, uh, California has continued and been able to 
keep up with its production of agriculture. But in California, it's not always a drought. In fact, um, they've had a couple of years recently where they had some enormous rain event. And uh, maybe you guys remember this. This occurred about three years ago. This was uh, all over the news, and, and people were watching it every day. Everyone was, was very, very worried about the Oroville Dam breaking. Um, I see Caden in the comments said uh, his grandparents were evacuated. And um, for rightfully so, people were terrified. This dam has a spillway. The spillway, I don't know if you can see where my little arrow is, but the spillway is located um, essentially in one little spot where my arrow is floating. And it started to overtop the entire dam. And everyone thought the dam was going to break. Um, it didn't break. And, and the dam was able to hold and fortunately, the, the damage was minimal. But after the floods receded, um, some friends of mine went in and they inspected it. Now, here's a, a close-up of that spillway. You can see it, it just looks like a giant water slide. That's about the width of, um, of a freeway or one direction of a freeway. And you see all these massive holes in the rock and you're going, Wait, how did that happen? That, that was from overflowing water? Yeah, because one of the things you're going to learn in, as, as you study civil engineering, when you get into your fluid mechanics classes, is you're going to learn about a phenomenon called uh, cavitation. If water, if water flows fast enough, instead of having positive pressure, it has negative pressure and it starts to boil and it starts to bubble. And because of that negative pressure, the water grabs onto whatever it's flowing over. It, it's, it's like sucks it up and pulls it out of the ground with it. And so the water that was flowing over this spillway was grabbing onto the rock, was grabbing onto the concrete, and it was breaking it and it was just pulling it out in massive chunks. And so that, that cavitation, that negative pore water pressure caused tremendous damage to that spillway. Okay, let's look at a couple other things, a couple other examples. Uh, the Empire State Building built in 1931. It was the tallest skyscraper in the world for 36 years. In 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge stood as a as a monument to engineering to the world. And it was the longest bridge in the world for 27 years. Um, and, and a word about skyscrapers and bridges. Why do I put so much focus and emphasis on those? Because where things like skyscrapers and bridges exist, those are evidences of infrastructure. And where there's infrastructure, there's economy. And where there's economy, there is prosperity. People are prospering. People are making money. And so in these larger cities where they're densely packed, you have lots of density, you have more connectedness in business, and it can generate greater economic activity. And generally, that's why you see these large cities are kind of the economic hubs uh, for the United States. And as you move away from large cities, the economies get much smaller. But as, as economies grow, cities grow up with the economies because large cities benefit the economies and the economies benefit large cities. So it creates this cycle of prosperity. And that's how these large cities get built throughout the world. And the United States isn't the only place to show this type of behavior. China recently um, just turned it on, and they turned it on in the last 40 years or so. So in 1985, only 33% of China was considered urban. The other 67% was considered non-urban or like farmland. By 2011, 51% of China's population was living in urban cities, large cities. 
It's been called by experts as the biggest mass migration in human history. Consider this, in 1981, 85% of China was considered to be in poverty. In 2005, that dropped all the way down to 16%. Again, the economic drive that happens when you build infrastructure. So what about here in the US? And you notice, and maybe you, you noticed a theme in all of these slides I was presenting. I kept saying themes like, it was the largest for 27 years. It used to be the largest for 34 years. And that's because the United States, since the uh, late 1950s, has shown a propensity for decreasing its expenditures on infrastructure. Every year, the amount of money spent on infrastructure, new infrastructure, and the maintenance of existing infrastructure has dropped. To the point where today we're down around 1% of our GDP is spent on infrastructure. If we compare that with Europe, Europe is over 5% and China is closer to 10%, which means that China is spending about 10 times as much of its money on infrastructure than we are here in the US. And um, Darren asked a really good question, how can we fix that? Darren, the truth is, there's no easy answers to that. Money is a great solution, but it's also an attitude change. We here in the United States, we need to recognize and be grateful for the infrastructure that we have. And we need to have a greater commitment to want to contribute to it and build it up. What if we don't? What are some lessons that we learn? Well, for instance, 2005. New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina, uh, that was a disaster. That was a tragedy. And it was because of a poorly kept levee system that was old and had been recommended for improvement and upgrade for years. But leaders, local leaders and federal leaders had ignored that. Minnesota in 2007, the westbound I-35 bridge you guys might remember that. That was 13 years ago. That was a tragic collapse of a bridge. We've been seeing every year crazy wildfires in California. And while this doesn't have anything to do with poor infrastructure, it has to do more with poor uh, environmental management and, and control of, of brush and growth. And we're seeing increased amount of fires because of that. The ones in Southern California in 2010 were absolutely devastating. Um, I, you know, this one is, is, is both sad and, um, well, I, I have to chuckle a little bit. You're looking at the campus of UCLA. And I have several friends who are professors at UCLA. In 2014, they were in the middle of one of the worst droughts they'd ever seen. And yet, a water main broke right on the UCLA campus. And it was because the water main was 20 years past its design life. Of course it's going to break. They lost about 20 million gallons of water in the middle of one of those worst floods. And that water was completely lost. You couldn't recover it. And if that wasn't enough, Two years later in downtown Los Angeles, it happened again, a major water line break. And sometimes the problem isn't that there's not enough water. Sometimes the problem is there's too much water. And we're beginning to see the effects of changes in climate and how we need to adapt and modify our infrastructure to be able to handle that. This picture just blows my mind. This was from Hurricane Harvey in Houston in 2017. The climate is changing. We, can't, we can sit and argue the reasons back and forth all we want, but the truth is we need to adapt our infrastructure systems to handle that because certain parts of the world and particularly our country are going to be affected more than other parts and we need to adapt the infrastructure accordingly. 
Um, before I go on, everybody who's listening and paying attention, um, will you please raise your hand to mark that you're here for attendance today? And then my TAs are going to uh, just leave your hands raised for a few minutes. My TAs are going to go through and uh, and get the roll. Okay. If you don't keep your hand raised, you might not get marked as here today. So please keep it raised. Get the roll. Okay. Hand raised, you might not get marked as here today. So and make sure you guys um, are muted. I'm hearing an echo. I'm going to mute everybody again. All right. The uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers is our professional organization of civil engineers. And it's a professional organization that um, is very invested and interested in infrastructure here in the US. And about 10 years ago, it started preparing for Congress um, a, a report card that it updates every four years. The most recent grade for America's infrastructure was a D plus. We're gonna talk more about this later this semester and you're going to get in and do a little more studies on your own about the report card. So one of the grand engineering challenges for the 21st century that um, the, the National Academies of Science has declared was to restore and improve our urban infrastructure. I love this poster. This was a poster that was prepared uh, five years ago when I taught this class. And um, it, it was put together by students. And I think it captures the message just perfectly, right? The world thinks civil engineers are a, bu are a bunch of men standing around in suits and hats, looking at big drawings and pointing at construction cranes and humming and, and, and whole humming and, and nodding their heads, right, uh, in between playing rounds of golf on the golf course. Now, we do play lots of golf, but there's a lot of stereotypes in that picture that, that are inaccurate. The right side of that picture is what we think we do. And this is how we feel about our jobs and how passionate we are. We are the silent guardians of society today. Our job is to keep infrastructure, keep society, keep the standard of living going for the, the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And we don't get a lot of credit. We don't get a lot of medals for what we do. They don't have a superhero like Iron Man for civil engineers. But if it weren't for civil engineers, the world would be a drastically different place. The uh, golf course is just off to the left of the picture there, Sean. Sorry. So we're going to talk a little bit more this semester about the ideas of sustainability. And sustainability is this idea that we need to only use what the earth and the economy and the people can spare in order to live and, and sustain our standard of living. If we spend too much in any of these areas of planet, people, or profit, then we're going to expend our resources and eventually we're going to run out. And, and so civil engineers live by the code of sustainability. So uh, just in closing, the objectives in this department, when you get your degree here in civil and environmental engineering, the objectives here are to develop innovative engineers who com competently apply their methods to meet human needs for water, shelter, and transportation. You're going to develop into a leader of global awareness who's going to be focused on the safety and the health and the welfare of the public while sustaining and protecting the environment. And you're going to develop into a citizen with outstanding moral character and commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're committed to in this department. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop the share. Um, are, there, are there any other questions that you guys have? If you uh, have one, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and quickly ask it. Otherwise, uh, we're going to end the class today.
Uh, I have a question real quick. Yes, sir. So yes, pulling up the uh, instructions for the first project, the poster one, yes. um, up in the top, it lists one theme. And then down in the rubric, it addresses, it says another theme. Do we go with that first theme? Um, yeah, go with whatever the theme says in the top. I'll have to double check that um, and correct that because they shouldn't be inconsistent. Just go with what it says in the main instructions, okay? All right. Thanks for letting me know. Thanks, Chase. I have a question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, when it says uh, work with up to three class teammates, does that mean that including yourself or excluding yourself? Like, is it three in total or four in total? Um, three in total. Okay, thank you. So two in addition to yourself. Um, if you guys want to organize in groups, I, I strongly recommend you get on to the messenger on Learning Suite and you can send out a message to the class and um, organize your groups that way. Um, you might find that easier than trying to do that here in the chat. I think a lot of us moved to the class of Discord to organize groups. So if you want to go there. Are you, are you talking to me on that, Rebecca, or are you talking to your classmates? Uh, everybody in general. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. I have a question. Okay. Um, could you, or that, the Venn diagram that was in the presentation, is there uh -huh. where we could view that? Yeah, so on Learning Suite, if you go to week number one, uh, you'll see a download uh, for that PowerPoint presentation on the schedule that I just showed. And you can save a copy of that yourself. And you can pull up any of the slides I showed you. OK, thank you. You're welcome. OK, any other questions? Awesome class today. Thanks so much, you guys. So, I, I got one. Oh, one more? OK. Um, currently, my schedule has been so whack this semester. I actually have two Zooms going on at the same time. And I mainly want to take your class just to get a little, of course, more knowledge about civil engineering. I'm in between civil and electrical. Um, and so I, I'm recording your class just in case I miss something. Um, I, this isn't really the best ideal um, way to take courses to at the same time, but I'm trying to figure out if there's any way that I'm able to, I, I know you have attendance as part of the grade, but um, is there any way that I'm able to watch the class immediately after this one? This one ends at 3.15, um, or is that just not possible? Yeah, that's not, that's not possible. Uh, just based on the rules of the class, um, live attendance is, is required, but I do record the lessons and, and put them up um, for those who want to watch later. But your, your situation is unique, um, and, and I'd recommend you pick one or the other, to be honest. Uh, you know, unless you're Hermione Granger with a time turner device thingy, uh, what you're trying to do, I would not recommend it. Okay. Um, where do you have them recorded or posted? Um, I haven't posted them yet, but I'll send a link out to the class. And, and okay. you guys know, it's on my, it'll be on my um, YouTube channel. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you everybody. I hope you have a great day.